Hello, I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to look at a game by the name of Chickwood Forest. This is a card game. It's a set collection game um, that is designed by Matt Loomis, pu published by Zoc. Uh, I have an English-German edition. I had to import that from Europe, but uh, I imagine Zoc will be bringing this to the U.S. It is a card game for two to five players. Uh, eight, the box says age is 12 and up. I think you probably could go younger on that. And the box also says it takes about 45 minutes to play. Um, I would say that's probably closer to half an hour. 45 minutes is a generous estimate of how much time it'll take you to play the game. And it is a set collection game, uh, set in, I guess, a fanciful uh, Robin Hood type universe where players are going to be playing, uh, um, I guess, a band of merry men who are trying to both get the most wealth and also redistribute the most wealth to uh, some poor villages. I will take a moment to show you how the game plays, and then I'll come back and let you know what I think about the game. I've set up here a two-player game of Chickwood Forest, and there are some slight changes, and the game comes with a really nice uh, player aid that shows you how the game setup will change based on the number of players. Uh, for example, this area here will get larger with more players, and with more players you'll use the opposite side of these cards and have more of them. Essentially, it'll be uh, one set of these castle cards per player that you have plus one. And this is essentially a drafting game uh, where players are going to be trying to collect um, various scoring cards over the course of the game, as well as trying to get area control in this village. The theme is somewhat uh, uh, a Robin Hood theme with, I guess, birds, chickens, uh, starring in the roles for Robin Hood. You're going to be trying to gather wealth and then redistribute it to the poor as shown on here. So uh, generally speaking, what you're going to be doing on your turn is... Um, you're going to be, at the start of the game, just randomly given one of these uh, cards here, which will tell you your turn order. So this player would play first. This player, in a two-player game, is playing third, so they just actually go second. And it'll also tell you on the top uh, how you're going to be playing cards. So you're going to have four cards, and this player here is going to play their first three face up, and then their last one face down, whereas this player is going to play two face up, then two face down. So the later you go in turn order, the more face down cards that you have. And there is a bluffing element in this game. So like I said, each player is going to get four cards, and you're going to have to play those cards to these castles um, to set up essentially uh, divisions of cards that a player will take at the end of the round. So this player, I'm not going to really strategize here, but all of these cards, I guess I'll, I'll mention here, will score you different things or allow you to place cubes out into this area for points at the end of the round, or at the end of the game, rather. So this player might choose to start off by playing this card here. Then this player would play a card. So maybe they want to collect both of those two chests, so they might put one here. I should note that the first two castles, as indicated on here, could those rows could only hold... Uh, two or three cards, whereas this one and then any other ones that would be there in a larger player count game will be able to hold any number of cards in front of them. So maybe this player might decide to put this one here. Again, they have to play it face up because they could play three face up. This player could play another card face up. They might choose to put um, this one face up here. Then this player would play their next card face up. Maybe they decide they want to put that one there. This player now could start playing their cards face down. They might choose to put um, this one face down. Again, they cannot play here now because this one already has two in its row. That's its limit. This player could play this card face down. Maybe they'll put this one face down here. And this player might choose to put this one face down here. Now in turn order, each player is going to take a castle card as well as any cards that are underneath it. So this player with the first player marker might choose to take a set. Um, Maybe they'll take this set here. They'll also take this card, replace their card. That will tell you the uh, turn order that they're going to take for the next round. Now this player would take a set. They would perhaps take this one, and then uh, they would get those cards as well. And I should mention that you'll resolve your cards as soon as you take them, player to player. So this car car set of cards here that this player took, they'd immediately resolve that. So this would just sit in front of them. That'll potentially score them points at the end. And then this card here, and any of these cards that have cubes on the top, mean that they will be able to place cubes into this area control uh, here. So these village cards are going to be set out at the beginning of the game. And you can see here they have spaces to put cubes, and they'll fill in in the numerical order. So top to bottom, left to right, one, two, three, four. You'll be placing cubes onto the, those. And they will be scoring players' points at the end of the game 
based on how many uh, rows are filled up. So if there were three cubes on this uh, this card, the first two rows would be considered activated. So the two and the five would be activated. But if there were five or six cubes on this card, the nine, all three rows would be activated, if that makes sense. So, um, it, you know, like I said, if there were three cubes on here, whoever had the uh, f most cubes on there would get the highest value thing, which would be five points. And whoever was in second place would get two points. And ties would be broken by whoever had placed the most recent cube. So if there were three players on here, one with each cube in the first three sp spaces, whoever placed on the three would get the five points. Whoever placed on the two would get two points. The other person would get one point. And the way that you're going to place those cubes on there is based on these cards here, which show cubes, which you could draft from that display. So this one would enable the player to place two cubes. And they have to be spent right away. And you're going to be able to, to place them on any number of cards that you could reach by moving horizontally. The catch being that you can't go on the same card twice during a uh, round. So this player might choose to go, for example, um, here and then here. And so they had their two cubes. They have to put it on two cards that they can reach by moving around. And in a, uh, a uh, three or more player game, this grid will actually have on it um, an extra row of cards, so there's some more spatial elements to uh, consider. Um, if you had, you know, for example, three cubes that you could place and you started here and then you moved here, you would not have to place your third cube. Um, and there are tactical reasons why you might want to do that, because, largely because you may not want to set up a, uh, another player um, in it able to being able to score because usually the last cube that you're placing on one of these villages is going to be worth more points. Uh, like I said, after that had happened, this player would pick their cards and then they'd resolve it right away. So these chests are a set collection. They would just keep those in front of them. And this card here is just going to be worth three minus three points at the end of the game. It's a henchman. So that player played it face down. This player ended up taking it. I believe that's how that happened. And then the uh, cards that weren't taken would just get discarded out. Players would get dealt four more cards each. And then uh, they would just start be playing again in the new turn order. So this player would play their card and so on, back and forth. So this will go until you run through the deck of cards. It's usually about, I think, maybe seven rounds. And then um, there's going to be a scoring. And I'll show you how the scoring works. There's a nice um, end game uh, scoring sheet summary uh, included in the, in the game. And also uh, they have on the uh, company's website a score pad that you could print out. I printed one of those out to laminate it. Um, but let's just say this player had this set of things in front of them. I prepared this in advance, obviously. So we had some chests. They had these castle cards they've collected at the end. Some of these negative cards. Some of these. And then some of those. Okay, so... And let me make sure I'm all on camera. I am. So here's the uh, scoring card, and you'll just go through these in, in order. Um, the first thing that you'll do is you will look at any of these uh, bust cards where players actually did not get loot. And that means that they will have to discard one of the chests that they have the most of. So this player has four green chests and one brown chest. They'd have to discard out that green chest, which wouldn't be used for scoring. Uh, then they'll score their chest, and the way the chest score is the, the you'll score positively one category, so this player has three green chests. That will be equal to the number of uh, chests that you have in that color squared, so the three chests would be worth nine points. And then you would lose one point for every chest of a different color that you have, so they would have nine points minus one point because they had another chest here, so that would be eight points for their chests. The next thing that you would look at are their garments, so they have a couple of these garments they've collected. These are going to be worth five points uh, per type that you have. So these two will be worth five points unless you have two of the same garments. So these would be actually worth zero points. So there's a risk element in taking those. So they would get ten points for their garments. Then you would look at their uh, jewelry. That will just score two, three, or four points based on how many points are printed on there. Uh, then the um, there's a Maid Marahen card, Maid Marion, I guess. Uh, and she'll score a point per type of treasure that you have. So this player had these, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points. Uh, so essentially they score per type. So these are three distinct types. That's a type, 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 and type. So they would score one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points for the main Marion card. Finally, the uh, henchman would be a minus three points. Uh, 
that would be the last card type that gets scored. Then also you get points for the uh, castle cards that you've collected over the course of the game. So going later in turn order actually gives you compensation and some points. So this, this would be a total of six points as players got for those. You'll typically have more of those. And then finally, like I explained before, you'll resolve the area control. So let's just say this was the situation and this player had maybe uh, an extra cube down here. So you would just go village by village and award points. So this player would get six points here, two points here, and two points here for, for their area majority. Whoever has the most points at the end of all of that is going to be the winner of Chickwood Forest. Uh, one other thing that I'll mention is that the game does come with some advanced rules cards, and you could add these in after you've played a couple times, and they'll give you instant effects, generally speaking, that you could spend as you acquire those cards. I won't explain those, but they are there to make the game a little bit uh, more complicated, if you'd like. Okay, so that is Chickwood Forest, and I have to say that this was a, a really pleasant surprise of a game for me. Uh, I... I... When I got the game, I saw that it took 45 minutes to play. I was a little bit apprehensive because it seemed to be a light card game. Uh, I was very pleased to see that there were more decisions in the game than I thought. And I was also su surprised and pleasantly surprised to see that it did not take 45 minutes to play. Uh, what the game most reminds me of, I think, is a, a pretty famous uh, card game by the name of Coloretto. But this is um, essentially like a gamer's version of Coloretto. You are going to be... Um, essentially trying to you know create an optimal set for you but not a set that other players are going to want to take and at the same time you know there's a, a bluffing element where you could also put cards into those sets that only you know what they are so that's another interesting dynamic and the scoring Colorado is a you know 15 or 20 minute game and this does take longer than that to play but this has much more complex scoring as well which creates some interesting decisions I like those cards that if you get one it's worth five points which is a lot for one card in the game but if you get two all of a sudden it's, be, it's worth zero points so over the course of the game as you see what other players are collecting uh, the valuations of those things are are going to be changing uh, pretty dramatically and I think that the game really does a good job of uh, making the various things worth various numbers of points to different players over the course of the game. Uh, there's also that interesting area control aspect of the game which is something that I generally like in games and I like that there's almost a push your luck element in this. Uh, typically you want to be first in a round to uh, grab the best pile of cards for you but at the same time, um, the last player to place in a given round or, or I guess in a given village uh, is going to break ties and uh, that's pretty powerful as well so that's another consideration. And I feel like this is a game that's really just filled with a lot of those small decisions which add up to something that's um, despite being really really smooth to play and really easy to play um, gives you a lot of nice decisions to make. The game it scores pretty highly but players are going to be um, if a player gets a lot of those chests, for example, they can really run away with the, the uh, scoring. So it becomes a, a aspect of a, you're trying to police what other players are doing, um, which you're really able to do, not just because you can take a pile that you think another player could do, but you could hide the cards face down that you know another player really needs to score a huge number of points. So overall, this is a really terrific family weight uh, card game. It's one that I really look forward to playing. I've played it with two players, and I've played it with four players now. And it uh, works very well at both uh, player counts. Um, I think that, um, like I said, it's one, I think I paid about 15 euros or so for this. It's one that I hope will make it to the state. Like I said, it's already published in a bilingual edition, so I imagine it will make it to the states. Um, but if not, I would heartily encourage you to uh, track this one down, import it if you must. Uh, so those are my thoughts on Chickwood Forest, and thanks for watching.